Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on the RISE Activity Monitoring and Reporting System, a digital tool to support country GHG inventory and MRV. Before we start our webinar, I'd like to go through some house rules to facilitate a sport event. This webinar is conducted in English and to facilitate a smooth program of the webinar, all feedback and questions will be taken during the discussion session after all the presentations. Please type your questions, comments, or feedback in the Q&A box or in the chat box. This session is being recorded. Now, again, welcome everybody to the webinar today. My name is Chang. I am from the International Rice Research Institute, and I'm your host today. As we are, as we have known, the Southeast Asian countries are increasingly seeking measurement, reporting, and verification or MRV systems for their rice sector to track progress towards climate goals and assess climate finance opportunity. However, existing platforms are, are often unstable, unsuitable or expensive for regional or national scale applications. To address this, a multi-step approach is needed. The International Rice Research Institute, ERI, is working to develop low-cost MRV systems that can accurately assess emissions, reduce investment risks, and identify mitigation opportunities. Our webinar today aims at discussing MRV requirements in the rice sector, showcasing the success story of rice more development in Vietnam and its potential for scaling across Southeast Asia, as well as facilitating collaboration opportunities with stakeholders and experts working in this critical area. This work is part of the New Zealand government-funded partnership with ERI in support of the objectives of the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases. This activity is also part of the CGIAR initiatives on Asian mega deltas and low emission food systems, and the agroecological transitions for building resilient and inclusive agricultural and food systems program. Um, to start our webinar, I would like to briefly introduce our speakers today. Um, first, from the Global um, Alliance. Um, the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases, Dr. Yasuhito Shirato is a soy scientist and has been working on soy carbon sequestration. He is the director of Division of Climate Change Mitigation Research Institute of Agroenvironmental Sciences in the National Agricultural and Food Research Organization in Japan. And one, he's also one of the three co-chairs of the Patty Rai Research Group of the Global Research Alliance. Next, Dr. Katerina Nelson is a behavioral economist and climate change scientist based at ERI in Hanoi, Vietnam. She has 15 years of experience working in international agricultural development with a focus on nature-based solutions and environmental behavior change. Her work is focused exclusively on climate change mitigation and adaptation and carbon market in the rice sector. Lastly, Dr. Buitan Ian is a climate change scientist and at the International Rice Research Institute. His background is agronomist and he has nearly 30 years working in agricultural and rural development, soil science, land use planning, geographic information system, and computer-based modeling. His current work focuses on climate change adaptation and mitigation practices and the development of digital system for MRV in rice production. We also welcome um, to uh, our webinar, Dr. Virendra Kuma, the principal scientist focused on with science and system agronomy and in, uh, from the International Rice Research Institute based in the Philippines. He is also the interim research director of the Sustainable Impact Department at ERI. He also leads the Climate Resilient Farming System Research Unit of ERI. The renders um, research and development program has been centered around five thematic areas aimed at achieving sustainable intensification of rice-based systems and climate change adaptation and mitigation. 
Verendo has published the results in more than 150 scientific communications, including more than 75 articles in peer-reviewed international journals. Again, welcome all of our speakers and panelists today. Now, I would like to um, turn the stage to welcome the opening remarks of Dr. Yasuhito Shirato from the Global Research Alliance, please. Okay, thank you for your kind introduction. Good morning, or some of you, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar, the Rights Activity Monitoring and Reporting System, a digital tool to support country greenhouse gas inventory and MRV. I'm Yasuhito Shirato from NARO, or National Agriculture and Food Research Organization, Japan, and I'm a, one of three co-chairs of Party Rice Research Group of the GRA, Global Research Alliance on Greenhouse Agriculture Greenhouse Gas Mitigation. So the other day, last month, uh, Dr. Bui Tang Yen of Iri, Vietnam office, contacted me and asked me to encourage uh, GRA Party Rice Research Group members to attend this online seminar. But today's topic is uh, MRV of paddy rice greenhouse gases. So I think this is uh, becoming a very hot topic and it's of great interest to many participants today. Now the number of participants are more than 40. So I hope the number will be increased increase a little bit more. Anyway, uh, so this topic is uh, very <clears throat> interesting for most of the audience. So I hope all the participants enjoy presentation and discussion today. So that's all, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yasuito Sirato. And to start our first presentation today, I would like to invite Dr. Catherine Nelson from ERI to present about the requirements for MRV in the rice sector, please. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yes. And you can see the slides in slideshow. Not yet, but it is now okay. Okay. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Very nice to be here, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Katie Nelson, as Chang has uh, introduced me already. Um, I'm just going to be providing a general overview of MRV in the rice sector uh, with the different types of tools that can be used. So just to give a little bit of background on what the M, the R, and the V mean, um, the M generally means measurement, or it can also mean monitoring. Uh, the measurements themselves are typically done using closed chamber uh, greenhouse gas boxes to establish emission factors, um, which are the, the emissions for different um, practices and different areas. So you may need to establish multiple emission factors for regions that have different types of soil or different types of farm management practices. Now, monitoring typically uses estimations, um, which use those emission factors to calculate um, the change in emissions over time using either empirical models such as the IPCC equations or biogeochemical models such as the DNDC. The reporting process generally happens at least at the national level through um, inventories that are reported through their national communications or through their biennial transparency reports. Um, <clears throat> And at the field level, the reporting then happens generally to the project or um, the, the particular region that that project is happening in. Now, validation and or the V can stand for validation or verification or both. Um, and these generally happen with a certified third party auditor. Um, which is maybe required to validate an area or a project according to a specific methodology, um, and then also to verify those emission reduction claims. 
And now MRV can be used for greenhouse gas inventories for NDCs, or it can be used to generate tradable carbon credits or emission reduction unit. It can be used for impact assessment at the project level um, or for company inventories and insetting, as well as for product certification. Uh, so why is it important is because currently all national greenhouse gas inventories are based largely on assumptions. Um, so these assumptions are often taken from polls or surveys, but those are generally done um, a single point in time and on a relatively small sample population. Um, and then these are quite expensive, so they're not done very um, very often. So the majority of, of inventories are actually based on assumptions. We don't actually know much about what's happening on the ground day to day or season to season. Um, and so transparent MRV is a really important requirement for being able to show progress um, towards our climate goals, as well as to unlocking finance. And in this case, it can be either bilateral agreements under Article 6, voluntary markets, um, or different types of um, finance through procurement or um, insetting. And it's very important part of producing uh, verified and responsible emission reduction credits that if there is going to be trade, the buyers can be confident in. And that's because there's no particular set value for one ton of CO2 equivalent. And the MRV type is generally going to dictate the value that the buyer is willing to pay. And I'll get into this in a little bit more detail when we talk about the different types of MRV. Um, so as I mentioned, then what you want to do with um, the, the data is also going to depend on what kind of MRV that you use. So there's compliance markets, including national inventories, um, trade between countries under Article 6, and then trade between different industries um, or different sectors in the domestic markets. Typically, these are going to use um, the IPCC empirical estimations, either with default emission factors, or if the country has established their own um, emission measurements, then they may have um, national level emission factors, which is considered tier two. Generally speaking, um, with bilateral agreements, the two countries um, will develop uh, their own agreed upon uh, methodology and way of, of measuring that, so their own MRV as well. Um, whereas with voluntary carbon markets, there's gold standard has a published um, methodology and that uses IPCC empirical estimations with either tier one or tier two. And Vera, the other large um, carbon registry is releasing very soon coming in quarter one of 2025, um, an approach that can use biogeochemical modeling. So this is, I, I mentioned this because all of these that are in this um, area that has been marked use the same type of data and input criteria for estimation, whereas the um, the modeling uses, and this requires extensive data for calibration and validation. And so cost can be a limiting factor, particularly in smallholder systems, because there are so many ways of, um, you know, uh, doing the farm management practices that you have to have mo many models calibrated. Um, so this is just a, quick rundown of the type of data that is collected. You can see it's not too many things. It's around 10 for national inventories um, and a little bit more if it's more for um, collecting data for branding low emission rice. Um, there is a difference between if it's for carbon markets or um, if it and, and what kind of data needs to be collected. Um, so just to give a, a, an overview of the different types of tools, um, there's a national level MRV type of tool, which generally will collect more of an aggregate type of data. And I'll go through each one of these individually as well, but this is just to show you what the um, uses and different tiers are for those and then how mature they may, the technology may be at this stage. Um, project level MRV, which is going to be at the farmer field level, um, and then you have measurements, uh, which also um, have quite a lot of costs to them. Sensors, satellite imagery, uh, process or sorry, the process-based or biogeochemical modeling, 
And then you have a combination between remote sensing and modeling. And I'll get into this in each one of these in more detail coming up. Um, so national level MR, uh, MRB, the majority of rice producing countries are collecting data on, um, on something at least. So they're generally collecting data on yield or and rice planted area in order to manage their food security, which includes import and export requirements, how they set rice prices and replenishing or accessing their reserves. This is typically observed data that uses existing reporting lines. And the benefits of this is that it is quite cost effective because this data is already being collected um, through existing data structures. And it benefits national data inventories by having um, updated and more accurate information that is publicly available and transparent. Some of the cons of this are that um, this practice often is not digitized. And so um, it can be quite a lot of work to digitize this, but it does um, improve the effectiveness if it's digitized. Uh, it does require um, additional data other than just yield and rice plant planted area to be added to these this observed data that's being collected um, on a, some kind of frequent basis. Um, and typically it requires that there's ownership at the national level. Um, and another con is that it's not accepted by global standards for um, emission reduction other than those um, under like UNFCCC for meeting the domestic requirements. Um, so when we talk about project level MRV, then this is really collecting data um, mainly through surveys at the field or farm level. Um, and then this is going to be mostly self-reported data. Benefits are that it aligns with the IPCC. It can be used for carbon credits. Um, it calculates mission data, tracks changes, and can also be used for traceability of products. Um, however, the cons are that individual surveys are costly, and this is generally done by like a field agent. Um, farmers can be trained to enter this data themselves, but they need to be quite advanced um, in terms of their literacy around digital tools. Um, Self-reported data has less trust for carbon buyers. Um, and therefore, there's generally a discount um, that's taken at least under the voluntary carbon markets for the, the level of uncertainty. And that's generally around 10% discount um, that would be taken using this kind of data. Uh, closed chamber measurements, I talked about a little bit before, but just to give you more information um, when using these, the requirements are that you would have three chambers per field, and then you'd need multiple um, measurements per stratum, which is uh, based on the biophysical and uh, social or management practices of that of those fields. So this could mean that you have um, in places that have a lot of variability, many stratum, and that would be then very expensive. The benefits are that it has high accuracy and high levels of trust, but it's quite expensive. Um, we're talking $1,200 plus per chamber per season. Um, and then you have very you know, labor and equipment intensive, intensive data collection and still high variability. In terms of field sensor options, um, these are water level sensors. You can have on the left side more cheap ones that are just a tube and then people manually collect the data versus automated ones that are can be linked in with the whole like internet of things and connect actually to water management. Some benefits is that um, they measure the actual level in the field that adds reliability to self-reported data. Um, and then it can also help farmers to manage the water better um, and automated sensors can actually reduce time for farmers. However, um, it can't be used alone. And so it is an additional cost to self-reporting. Um, if you're using manual uh, tubes, it can add an additional burden to farmers or record keepers. The um, automated sensors have a relatively short life because they're continuously exposed to elements. And so the batteries and other types of um, mechanical operations tend to break down. Um, and then it could also require subscriptions or installation fees, which requires ongoing um, finance to be able to sustain that. 
Remote sensing, um, it uses satellite technology essentially to detect what's happening at the farm level. However, it's limited to just um, a few types of activities like planting dates, harvest dates. Um, and there's a lot of research that has been going on for many years on detecting water levels. Um, remote sensing tends to have the highest like accuracy in terms of its trust from buyers. But the difficulty um, is that it also can't be used alone. There's other kinds of um, practices that you still need to get through surveys. Um, the high resolution satellite imagery is very, very costly. So we're talking $20,000 plus for one season of um, that kind of costly satellite imagery. The free satellites have too long of passover gaps. Um, and this requires very heavy computing power, which can mean that scaling this kind of technology is difficult. Um, the free satellite imagery is generally not suitable for field level MRV, but it could be for regional or national. Um, and then there are limitations to the spectral or spectrometry of the actual satellite, mainly also due to cloud cover and the canopy cover. Um, so just two more slides, I'm almost done here. Uh, just in terms of biogeochemical models, um, those are using complex modeling to simulate the greenhouse gas emissions. Some benefits here are that you can account for multiple changes in farm management practices at once. Um, and there is generally a high level of trust from buyers. However, it's incredibly data intensive um, and very costly then to calibrate and validate these models to a degree of uncertainty that's acceptable by the, ver the third party verifiers. Which means it's then also difficult to use in smallholder systems because they have very high variability across farms. Um, and then the, the most common model, which is called the DNDC model, is copyrighted to one particular company for use. And so that also limits um, the, the ability for other people to, um, to use that existing model. So finally, when we come to the combination between remote sensing and modeling, this uses the satellite technologies combined with machine learning to simulate what's happening at the farm level. Um, so once these are calibrated and validated, it should operate at a relatively low cost, although it does still have high computing power requirements um, and it has a high level of trust from buyers. It is, however, extremely data intensive, very, very costly to um, gather the data that requ requires to run the models. It's not still ideal for field level estimations due to that variability. Um, and then it's quite costly and still has issues of around the type of spectrometry that's blocked from cloud cover or the canopy. Um, and the models then still are copyrighted that this is built on. Um, one more that I didn't mention, but I'll just quickly mention is the direct methane satellite measurements. And um, those, there's a lot of discussion around them now, but um, they are also not really appropriate for field level measurements. So that's all I'll say to those, but um, we can open it up then for questions or um, moving on to the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Catherine Nelson, for giving us the overview of um, the MRV methodologies and carbon market situation, as well as explaining the um, different approaches, methodologies, and supporting tools for MRV at different levels. Um, let us now look at one particular system that has been developed by in co cooperation between the e International Rice Research Institute and the government of Vietnam. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Wooten Yen to give an introduction of the Rice More system, please. Thank you, Chan. Allow me to share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. All right. So uh, good morning again, everyone. Uh, my name is Buitan Ian. I'm a climate change scientist at IRI, and I'm based in Hanoi, Vietnam. So follows the uh, presentation of Dr. Catherine Nelson about uh, how important 
the the uh, crowd data or activity data is to be able to fit into the MRB system. So in my presentation uh, today, I'd like to, to show our solution, uh, the digital solution uh, to collect the uh, rise activity uh, data at the ground level uh, uh, with the, in, in the last scale. Uh, okay. Uh, before going to the introduction of RISE uh, monitoring and reporting system, I would like to give you a like, very quick uh, overview about the global accepted GSE quantification standards. For example, like here, like uh, UN FCCC, the, uh, um, the methods is uh, use, using the IPCC default in, uh, emission factor to quantify uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, gold standard in the very recent version of the methodology that they released uh, last year also follow the IPCC default uh, emission factor. Uh, Vera um, developing uh, the, the new methodology considering um, uh, modeling, direct measurement, and also the IPCC default value. So all three uh, uh, quantification standards refer to the IPCC for emission value. Therefore, the global assets, uh, national uh, greenhouse gases inventory and carbon projects still rely on these methods. Uh, if we follow the IPCC uh, for emission uh, factor, so what is the activity data need to be collected at the, uh, at the ground uh, level? Uh, we see that in the pre-season, uh, it's uh, required pre-season water regime, the timing of straw incorporation and amount of straw incorporation. That, uh, I mean, the straw from previous season, that's when uh, it incorporates in the soil and prepare for the next season. Also, the methods of land preparation. If the, uh, the farmer apply the wet uh, land pre preparation or the dry land preparation like uh, DSR, dry DSR. And also the, the amount of organic amendment at the basin fertilizer. During the season, the input uh, information, input data is like mechanized field operation, uh, uh, planting date, harvesting date, uh, field area, lamb application, nitrogen uh, rate, and also the in-season water management. Uh, at the end season, uh, we need the uh, harvesting meters and also the straw management. Uh, if uh, straw is uh, being removed or burned or incorporated in the soil. So now there are two technologies that can uh, collect those data. For remote sensing, it's not all that required data can be collected. Uh, as far as uh, I know, uh, because of uh, of the technical limitation of remote sensing, so few of them can be uh, fine and collected already uh, proved uh, that it's worked very well in the last scale. For example, that uh, uh, pre-season water regime uh, before having the right plan on the field is quite uh, easy to see if the field is flooded or not. But during the season, when the right plan already developed, and it's quite challenge to see how uh, the, the water level on the field, and also to detect how many times that water has been uh, drained out. Similar to the straw management, it's very hard to use remote sensing to see how uh, uh, how many straw. Uh, incorporated in the field or how many straw burned on the field, fertilizer um, application is impossible to detect uh, using uh, satellite images. Therefore, the field observation or measurement is still very important. Uh, it's, it's used uh, human eyes to observe or measure all the parameters needed for GHG quantification that is with, uh, used in the GSE inventory or project MRB. Uh, 
what is uh, monitoring reporting in Southeast Asia? So we uh, did a quick scoping study in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, so we see that in own country, own three country, there is a network that they collect the data from the village or commune, report to the higher level of management. It's quite like follow the manual uh, uh, process. So in the village, uh, the officer go to the area that they are in, in charge for and collect the data. They can send to higher level by the full call, take a picture, or write handwriting note, or sometimes during the direct meeting. From district to province and province to national level, they have some form to fill in the data and have a stamp uh, like this, you see on the screen. That's a kind of the, the uh, screenshot of, uh, of the paper form that in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam are using currently. So in each level there are a lot of the uh, of, of the uh, our work for uh, keying in the data and uh, our grid owns the data from the low level to the high level we see that in those country uh, this lack of the digital system for monitor monitoring and reporting the right activity data uh, multiple way for reporting, as I explained earlier. Uh, in Cambodia, it's very common uh, to use a Telegram. It's a social media platform. In Laos, it's use WhatsApp. In Vietnam, it's use Zalo. So they send the, the, the data, but still need the, someone to collect all data and do arrangement uh, and, and, uh, and uh, processing before submit to the higher level. So this is quite time consuming. Uh, uh, and it's a lot of work because in I, as far as we see in uh, Southeast Asia, right activity data have to be reported weekly. So every week, in every level, one person have to working on the data entry. So data is mainly collected for right management and statistics. It's not really uh, includes uh, the uh, information that is useful for this inventory. Therefore, to use those data for this inventory, a lot of assumptions uh, have been made. So what is the solutions that we propose? Uh, this is the right activity uh, monitoring and reporting system. Uh, we call it uh, rice more. So rice more is a digital system that support uh, collecting data at uh, a different level. Uh, rice more is not a new data collection technology. Here I have to emphasize that this is not a new data collection technology, but it's a digital solution to improve the efficiency, accuracy, uh, traceability, and accessibility of the right data. Uh, what are the uh, technologies that we use to develop this RIMO system? Uh, mostly we use an open source platform and, and uh, programming language. Uh, for example, uh, Netcore uh, 5.0, Angular, Bootstrap, etc. So the web, the, 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 uh, the product is a web application and a mobile app can be used freely without the license fee. So it's a very uh, good opportunity for the developing country to use this system without uh, paying the operation cost. So uh, the system already validated and adopted in Vietnam. What is the function of price more? Here I can uh, show you how, how uh, it's the main function. It standardized the right uh, activity data from very low level, uh, can be the communal level or, or village level. So then it's uh, aggregate to the national level. It support geo reference, so all the data collected and reported at, on the ground can be mapped using the 
amid uh, administrative map and it's real court because the near real time activity data it means weekly data it support uh, querying synchronizing and extracting data for right production management so it's uh, can have a function in the system can have the manager to uh, make uh, some data query for different purpose of of uh, management it's also managed a hierarchical uh, account owns user uh, uh, one um, has a, um, it provided uh, an uh, account so they can log in uh, king in the data, update the data for the area that they uh, are responsible to. Uh, then in, at the high level, all management also have uh, the account. So we can uh, increase the security level of, of the system by controlling this account. Uh, connect to this quantification tool, uh, tier one and tier two. Uh, the system already have a link. So if uh, activated uh, data filled in the database, it can link to the quantification tool and return the amount of JC uh, emission by gas and also by uh, right quantification states. Here's how uh, the database is linked with the GIS map. So weekly, when the data is recorded from uh, from the uh, common or uh, village level, it will link to the administrative uh, map and also have a quick function to uh, visualize the data in the, like uh, digital map in the pie charts or in the data table. Uh, the system allows the manager to have a uh, very deep uh, uh, criteria querying, so it can extract any kind of data, any combination of data already exists in the system. So it's a very useful, not only for this um, uh, inventory or calculation, but for rice management at the national scale. Uh, here, in this graph, I in this slide, I would like to show you how is RIMO operation and the data flow. As I mentioned earlier, so at the village or co common level, the officer will log into the system and update weekly activity data. The data will be up, um, um, automatically sent and request the, the, the next level is district uh, level and a province level officer. Once they see the request, they will come and check uh, for the qual uh, quality of the data. Once it's approved, it's automatically updated to the national database. So at the same time, if a uh, district or province level officer approve the data, all level can see uh, the data appear on the map. For example, like military, want to have a quick uh, uh, summary of the right production progress in the country, they can open the app or, or, or web page to have the data. So at the regional and national level, the officer also only uh, uh, support the lower level for admin uh, management or account management or uh, planning, et cetera. But they do not need to working on the data summary or data analysis anymore. Uh, the system also open partly for the public user. They can access to the system to see some uh, uh, brief information on the right production, but not be able to uh, modify the, um, uh, uh, the data, ping in data, extract data but can see the visualizes data on the screen. Uh, Rice more has two components. So we, at the national uh, level, uh, we develop a web-based uh, one. It can record the list or common uh, 
uh, appraised data sa post statistic uh, uh, record uh, production planning uh, climate uh, risk response from uh, incentive early warning and also support national GSD inventory so that's the purpose of using the the uh, national level uh, monitoring and reporting component for the field uh, or project level monitoring and reporting we have another component that you see uh, here we develop uh, uh, as the app mobile app uh, platform uh, it can be used to record farm field activity data is more detailed uh, minus multi, uh, multiple data sets for baseline and online record track a chain of farming practice estimate GSC emission and also support MRP for carbon process. Uh, so in the two system can uh, work and and support each other. So it can the, the whole rice small system can be used for both national scale and also project scale. How is data security? May, uh, maybe many uh, participants will uh, ask for this question. Here's uh, how our uh, solution. Uh, we we install, we develop the system and install it for each country in their own server. So the government owner server is a key, key thing. Every staff that is involved and responsible for the data input and data uh, um, management is a, a government officer. So no third party involved in the data management. So uh, like in Vietnam, we developed the rice mall for Vietnam and is stored in the, uh, the server of ministry, agriculture and rural development. If other country also interests in this system, we will uh, adjust the system as uh, follow the, the country contact and requirement and also installed in, in, in the country on the uh, server. So it's, uh, that's uh, how it works. But it's, uh, the database is separate from national uh, database and also project database. In project database, the data can go from the field agent, collect the field plot data, report to project officer for the project unit, and also to the report to project manager. It can open one database in the server for the project. Uh, why we set up in this way? Because like in Vietnam, all the carbon project have to be managers and resist uh, uh, traces to, uh, with the government agency. So government agency will be able to track the chain and progress of the uh, carbon project in the country. So this is the way that we can uh, allow uh, the data store in, in the um, government server. Um, yeah, in the uh, future, we will develop another version of the system that's also allow uh, the user to define where the, the data will be stored in the government server or their own server. Uh, this slide demonstrates how the time series data for national level is recorded and is based in rice more. So from this uh, animated uh, image, you can see that uh, uh, the planting progress of uh, uh, rice at the common level in Mekong Delta of Vietnam, uh, and also the change in the uh, proposal of rice variety per week. So in every week when the planting, uh, when, when uh, the commune complete the uh, planting, then they also report how many hectares of uh, dry variety A, dry variety B in their area. So the system gathering information from all commune and make sure the statistics is very useful for country level to see uh, like uh, a proposal distribution of different variety and so it's important to make a plan for the export or natural um, storage. So the, what is data that is uh, currently recorded in Vietnam is a weekly data uh, about the planting uh, variety 
uh, farming practice, like farm, farming type, uh, water, fertilizer, pesticide, trauma management, and mechanization. Uh, we also uh, opened a, a, a database for climate-related loss and damage. For example, in the case of a drought, flood, a strong wind, or, or salinity intrusion, uh, typhoon, they can also report a percentage of the yield loss into the system. Uh, here also the weekly harvesting progress and so the yield farm gate price is all necessary information that Department of Crop Production in Vietnam requires. So this can be built in, in the system. But it's not limited to this uh, information. If for other country, it may need another set of information. So we can also modify the database and update it on the map. For the farm and field data project level, uh, here you see that how the um, app is working, uh, getting the location of the field and also fill in the, the, the farming practice for particular field. That's important to uh, calculate the greenhouse gases emission and support the MRV as a field farm level. Uh, we did a, a validation of the system in Vietnam early uh, this year in, in April. So we compare what is the, the information that uh, local officer report using this uh, report using this system and also the survey data that we conduct at the household level and see that's a very in, interesting result. For some indicator like AWD, uh, the difference is about 9%. Uh, is the, th the table here so you the observation is percentage and also uh, report uh, in percentage. So for example, in the winter spring season in the first district in the table, uh, the observa observation is a ninety six percent, but they report hundred percent. So it's very close, but uh, it's not so close. If we look at the, the straw management, the difference is quite high. It's about 55% uh, uh, difference. This means that it uh, has uh, some difficulty for the officer to estimate the amount of straw is burned on the field because it's, it's not e easy. Uh, they have to understand how uh, the cutting haze after the after harvest time and also the variety to be able to estimate the correct uh, amount of uh, of uh, straw uh, to be burned, so it's quite uh, challenged and and difficult. That's why the difference is very high. So it's an opportunity to have another component uh, uh, of of uh, of uh, remote sensing work can somehow uh, have to improve the accuracy of this report. What is a lesson learned from our work in, in Vietnam? So the system development, the need is depend very much on the management criteria of the, uh, of the, of the country and also projects. So it needs some assessment per country or, or projects for the system. So that is when require the cost for system assessment and replication. For capacity building, uh, to be able to uh, scale the system in the countrywide, it uh, requires uh, a lot of training. So we in Vietnam, we need the training in each province. So it's, it's take a lot of time and, and efforts. Uh, to to uh, address those uh, difficulties, we organize the uh, local training team and conduct a TOMT, which is training for master trainer and also training for trainer. So that's key person when we when go to every province to provide training. So it's the work when go much easier. Uh, we need also uh, need to consider the different understanding of a farming terminology among the geographic region. So the, like the case in Vietnam, one term may be uh, uh, understand it uh, differently in different uh, regions. Implementation. 
Let's make use of existing reporting network in the country, so we do not design a new reporting network. As I mentioned earlier, RiceMore is not new uh, data collection technology, but it's make use of existing reporting network in the country to minimize the operation cost. The system should be managed and operated by the government agency to help uh, to ensure the data security for the for the country. It's combined with the monitoring and reporting of uh, other food products is also uh, recommended by by the user by the country. Uh, for example, like uh, add uh, cash crop vegetable in the system, so rice more can become a platform for reporting. Uh, our culture products. So that's uh, that, uh, the, the requirement from uh, stakeholder when we operate the system in Vietnam. For com com communication, also it's important to allocate the buses and, and uh, communication product to, to produce more communication, uh, communication product at the beginning of the project. Yeah, so the uh, until now, uh, rice more had been uh, transferred to Vietnam government and is officially op operated, covering about seventy five percent of rice planting area. What is the next step beyond rice more? From his uh, slide, you can see that our proposes MRV framework does uh, activity data play a very important role to provide input for this VSC uh, quantification. So in coming year, we will uh, uh, develop another tool that can also link to this system and link to the rice more uh, at the farm and national level to input the input data and also VSC quantification. Uh, we we are working on remote sensing right now. Uh, hopefully, we can have a component uh, uh, approved, validated, and connect to the system. We are also working on tier three modeling of the ZSC uh, emission from the right field. Uh, so, in coming year, uh, we expect that early of uh, 2027, 20, we will have the model ready and can be connected to the uh, rice more system. So the user just select a tier one, tier two, or tier three. Then they have the uh, value of the quantification automatically calculated and returned to the system. Yes, thank you. This is my, my overview of uh, the right activity monitoring and reporting system that we develop and uh, implemented in Vietnam, uh, we're looking forward to see the opportunity to work with other countries and also support to develop a na national system like this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bhutan Ian. Um, and uh, after the introduction of the RISMO system, we would like to open the floor for um, plenary discussion. Um, we would like to invite everybody to share their uh, feedback or uh, opinion or contribution regarding the relevance of this RISMO system to national rice production governance systems or mechanisms, as well as to um, spark potential collaboration on research and development or technology transfer consultancy in terms of developing similar systems for MRV in the rice sector in other countries in the Southeast Asia. We have participants from um, government agencies of Cambodia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, and other countries. Um, we also have attendees from the academia and um, organization um, for development. So um, we would very much welcome your contribution. Please raise your hand if you would like to speak or put your questions into the Q&A and we will address them live for you. Uh, we already have some questions in the Q&A from Namfa. Um, there's a question on that uh, on the rice ball system that the system is excellent. How can we enhance it further by integrating the latest satellite imagery, and how can we make it more accessible and user friendly for farmers? Um, I can see that Dr. 
um, Dr. Catherine Nelson is uh, typing her answer, but in the meantime, um, if Dr. Wooten Ian can also address this question live, please go ahead. Yes, thank uh, Nam Phan uh, for your question. Um, yes, we yeah, as uh, the, the last slide that I show in my presentation, we are in the progress to develop a uh, uh, MRV framework, including satellite um, technology remote sensing technology. So we will have just component plugged in the system. Uh, once the country have a system installers and operators, uh, they can connect their data to the satellite remote sensing component, the API. So uh, yes, um, another component that I mentioned in the system is uh, for projects or the field farm level data collection the farmer can 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 use the satellite image uh, for example if they select the uh, the one point in the field uh, and give them the time frame uh, to, and request to calculate uh, GSC quantification um, uh, emission for like uh, 10 years ago to make the baseline to compare for their practice uh, for example the system will send the information of the location of the uh, year to the remote sensing component. Thus, remote sensing component will look at the three image shots and analyze, analyze the data, gives them an answer. Is this the right planted before in this area? Is this called um, uh, location? And how is the right information before? Then they use such information to estimate the emission. So currently, we do not go so far, but already prepared for the next step. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Britain Ian. Um, and we have other questions in the Q and A box. And we inform the International Rice Research Institute as can recourse for fields under different programs, for example, under the one million hectare program, can be can those be submitted separately? And how the how will the production areas of different programs are displayed on the map? Uh, yes, thanks, Anwen, for your question. So the system uh, will separate the database for separate projects. So if one million hectare managed by the government, they can have a one uh, database named one million hectare, for example. So all staff working under that projects can report data and it's recorded to the, the database. Another project want to um, work and, and open the database in the government server, they can send the request to the uh, admin person so he, they can also open a database for another project. So so it's work separately, but can also support in the uh, like the same uh, management structure. Currently, the uh, uh, the system here we design for national scale. So using the administrative map of the country at the common level. But for the one million hectare program, they will work at the uh, cooperative level. So they need another map layer uh, to be able to, to display all the indicator collected from the one million hectare on the map. They have to uh, upload the, the program map or project map and do a little bit of background setting and, and uh, uh, customize before using the, the system for, for projects. Thank you. Thank you for elaborating the answer. We have another question coming in in the Q&A. What is the difference between price more and the sector tool? And this question refers different tools. Maybe I would like to invite Dr. Catherine Nelson to address this question, please. Thanks very much for the question. Um, so the main difference is the sector tools are providing the calculation for greenhouse gas emissions, whereas the rice more <laughs> tool 
um, which has embedded within it also the farm or field level survey um, called the, the farm more tool. Um, those are the data collection um, tools. So basically the, um, the calculation requires input parameters about farm management practices in order to be able to provide the estimates. And so Rice Moore and Farm Moore then collect that input data that is then run through on the back end the, through the sector tool and then responds with a greenhouse gas um, emissions of the farm practices. So those are, they're, they're interlinked um, and, but the sector tool is the one that's actually providing the calculation, whereas the um, farm more and rice more tools are the front end, let's say. Thanks. If there's any further questions, please let me know. Thank you, Dr. Catherine Nelson. We also have another question relating our different tools. What kind of sensor that are used in the in this satellite system, and how about the temporal and spatial resolution? Um, I assume this referred to a question earlier about our remote sensing that Dr. Catherine Nelson had addressed. Let me also bring that up for our plenary discussion. How um how well the satellite and uh, uh, the combination of satellite process modeling machine learning approach work in data poor environments? Can you comment on the role of machine learning to fill these data gaps? And another question, um, that should be the, the and another question regarding uh, remote, sensing, remote sensing and water level sensors. Is there, is there any kind of studies on farmer self-reported information for in a project MRV? Uh, for example, quality compared to field agent reported data. It was mentioned that this requires a high level of literacy to report and is usually done by a field agent. Um, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Catherine Nelson to address this question. Please. Okay, thanks. Did you want me to address all of the questions? So the ones about satellites and data? Yes. Uh, from farmers? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so in terms of the sensors that are used in the satellite system, um, the, the ones that are able to detect the water levels need to be a certain type of sensor, and that's because they need to be able to um, move through the canopy of the rice crop. So they need to be able to go through that to what's um, underneath that canopy. So once the more satellites can be used when there isn't anything on the surface in terms of the plant growth, but as soon as the plants start to um, get a certain age, then then some satellite imagery can't be used. Um, so mainly the Sentinel-1 and 2 are the free satellites that can be used. Um, but two, Sentinel-2, to my understanding, um, became inoperational um, maybe a year or so ago. And so only Sentinel-1 is currently functioning, and that has a 12-day Passover gap, meaning that um, it's possible to miss those drainage events. And that's what also makes using the free satellite imagery difficult or challenging. Um, however, you can use paid satellite imagery um, that is uh, SAR, SAR technology, um, which is a specific type of um, spectral radar technology. And um, the satellite imagery that we've used is called ALOS Pulsar data. Um, however, those need to be purchased. There are some now that are like semi-public, but they only have small windows of data that are being made available now. That data from the Allos Pulsar satellites um, is quite expensive. So that's where I mentioned it was around $20,000 to, to collect one season's worth of images. And recently, somebody um, that is working on this data mentioned to me that of all of those images that um, they were able to collect over a couple of seasons using satellite using the free satellite data from Landsat, Landsat no Sentinel One, um, was they were only able to collect twelve days of clear images total, um, where there's no cloud cover. So both cloud cover and um, the the other kinds of spectral imaging are both really important. 
um, to be able to to train the models that the satellites can operate with. Um, there is now um, several new satellites that um, are expected to be launched within the next year, which will add um, a considerable amount of um, like new information uh, or or create shorter passover times. So that's really the the benefit is that we know that satellites are improving all the time and more and more are getting um, launched. And so during this kind of crucial period of time, we need to also be collecting the data at the ground level to be able to train those models. Um, <clears throat> most of them still cannot don't have high enough resolution to work <clears throat> at the individual field scale in very small scale systems. Um, I, I I couldn't say off the top of my head what exactly that resolution is for the different satellites, um, but it 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 is difficult to um, to to identify the practices at an individual field level. Um, so in terms then then the next question, which was about how machine learning can support um, the uh, process-based modeling with satellites in data poor environments. I think this is important because um, there is a, a, a strong interest in moving solely to satellite um, and, and other kind of automated data because of costs. They, you know, it's quite expensive to do any type of ground truth data, but in data poor environments, which frankly, the majority of where rice is grown are relatively data poor environments in terms of knowing what farmers are doing like on a day-to-day -day or a seasonal basis um, in their management practices. And so we actually need to collect that data in order to be able to train the models. So there's not really a lot of getting around that combined cost of needing to do the research on training the models using the satellite images um, with the ground truth data so that we can eventually get to a point where we have enough data that the models can be trained to um, run with a high enough level of accuracy that it's accepted by global standards. Um, we do hope to get there eventually, but um, it it will probably likely take a couple of years. Um, and then to the question that was on um, the level of literacy of farmers and their self-reported data versus data that's collected by field agents. Um, we do see that the farmers um, submitting log books, um, that generally speaking, uh, if there's no incentive for the farmer to do so, then the data can be relatively low quality. Um, and Lucas, who asked the question, also mentioned that it's, it's coming from companies who want to reduce costs by not having their field agents collecting the data from farmers. However, in the research and studies that we've done, um, it's really important that digital tools are not treated as a replacement for that in-person or face-to-face -face interaction between field agents and farmers. Um, so there is potentially some point where farmers could be trained to um, enter this data on their own, but unless they see a direct benefit or incentive to do so, um, it is unlikely that we will really move directly to um, farmer farmer reporting without the field agent as an intermediary. Um, in most cases, those field agents are already deployed into the field to support the farmers with other activities or with expert advice. In those cases, it shouldn't add an additional cost, but it just becomes um, a, an added benefit or a different type of tool that can be used. And the benefit there is that once you do have information about what farmers are doing um, through a digital tool, then they can be provided with accurate and tailored um, uh, uh, interventions or, or expert advice through their mobile phones. So I still think that the digi digital tools provide um, an excellent tool to be able to communicate with farmers, but they shouldn't be used to replace these field agents. Okay, I think I covered all the questions, Chang, did I? Yes, yes, you did. Okay. Thank you for explaining very thoroughly about these questions. Um, I would also like to welcome other speakers if they um, would like to contribute to the discussions.
regarding the the last question that um Katie mentioned about um field agents and their work to uh, collect data for MIV, we also received a question that this is a very good and interesting system. Can this system monitor a very small area? Because in Indonesia, farmers are usually practicing different management just in a small scale of area. And how many field agents are required for the whole country? Um, Dr. Bertinian, would you like to address this question? Thank you, Chang. Yes, I'm happy to respond to Mr. Miranti. Uh, so um, actually, uh, in in like uh, the uh, right more implementation in Vietnam, uh, we learned that uh, it's impossible to have a field data collection at the uh, country level for air for, for one country so in in vietnam we based on the existing network of uh, uh, cropping uh, system uh, cropping production reporting and monitoring so in x common uh, the government have a one person responsible for for collecting the data and report uh, to the high level uh, weekly so the system design in that way so one person in common, they can collect the average data from their observation and, and report uh, up to, to the national level. The, the system be able to work at the farm level, but like uh, Dr. Nelson uh, just mentioned, uh, the question how, how to encourage a farmer to use the system and report their field data. Because we have a no uh, incentive mechanism and farmers receive no benefit from using this digital tool. So currently, it still need to use the, the existing system already funded and operated by, by the government. Uh, yeah. If uh, you use the system for one cup one project with a small uh, area, like a few thousand hectare price, so you can have uh, like uh, uh, collaborator or, or the officer of the projects working in in some small area, a few hundred of um, dozens uh, hectare. They can do the report and and provide average value for those area. But I still do not see that it's necessary to uh, have a. Uh, the data for every field, every plot at the household level. Thank you. Please let me know if my my answer already satisfy what uh, uh, your question. Thank you, Dr. Bhutan Ian. It is exciting to see um, the discussion getting very robust about different technologies in particular and the RISMO system in specific, in particular to our support MRV. I would like to invite our speakers from um, the research uh, bodies, uh, Dr. Verendra Kuma from IRI and Dr. Yasuhito Shirato from GRA to share their perspectives about the potential collaboration in this area. I, Either for research and development or technology transfer in terms of our MRV methods, systems, and supporting tools. Please go ahead. Uh, Trunk, can I go ahead first? Yes, yes, oh, okay. please be in there. Yeah, so thank you for this opportunity. I think good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to everyone who joined us uh, today in exploring this critical advancement in MRV systems for the rice sector. Um, Katie gave very clear presentation and, and clarified the confusion about different MRV systems, different types of MRVs existing and with their pros and cons. And I think then uh, Dr. Yen provided very a good example, a wonderful presentation on rice more, I clearly showcased that there's a great opportunity to exploit this uh, monitoring and reporting of rice activities digitally, which otherwise government officials are doing manually. And this uh, rice more system can help government, you know, improve their efficiency. But at the same time, this data, which can be used for more accurate estimation of national greenhouse gas inventory and for the carbon project. 
I think uh, this is critical. Uh, and this can also, because we are real time data coming through this uh, rice more, this can help us in establishing accurate greenhouse gas baseline and in identifying the hotspot areas for precision targeting. Because in rice, um, by default, we assume that um, rice mean continuous flooding as a baseline. But I think things are changing with time. And um, we have done some several surveys, even from Vietnam, majority of farmers are doing some drainage. One, some farmers are doing multiple drainage. So, but for the carbon project, we consider, or for the national inventory, we consider rice mean continuous flooding, and we use default uh, IPPC value, which uh, give a different baseline. And then we compare that baseline with our intervention, whether it's a straw management or, or water management compared to the continuous flooding. But I think this kind of data can help us establish the accurate baseline, which probably is missing. Uh, the baseline maybe we are using maybe not right. And this kind of tools and data coming, I think this can help us in establishing baseline and then using those baseline, comparing what are the mitigation options existing and how much those uh, uh, mitigation options can further reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission for the carbon uh, credits. Also, I think uh, um, with this kind of data, real-time data which are coming, and then we can use uh, remote sensing and then uh, you know modeling approach. This can really be very powerful to move from tier one, tier two to tier three approach as highlighted by Dr. Yane and Dr. KT. And I think tier three approach is more robust uh, that may fetch higher price uh, for the carbon in the carbon market. And so that's another great opportunity. The, the thing which uh, uh, Yane highlighted is that, you know, the, the process which most of the government official follow for collecting this rice activity data are very similar in most of the countries in Southeast Asia. And probably the similar approach is followed by many other countries in uh, South Asia or in Africa. So to me, I think uh, this approach of Rice More or the tool uh, which has been developed and uh, validated in Vietnam uh, is very exciting and it can be replicated and can be expanded to other countries easily. Of course, we may have to adapt a bit, but I think our base uh, is there, background is there, uh, base tool is there. I think and we can fast track uh, and, and deploy these tools in other countries. So I would say that these tools, uh, uh, I call them as a trunky solutions. So once we have developed the, the base uh, of the, the methodology, and then uh, how we adapt much faster and deploy to the new geographies. I think that's an opportunity for us to expand and uh, the support uh, given by the New Zealand uh, Ministry for, uh, for Primary Industry and then uh, collaboration with uh, our national partner is key to, to take these uh, tools to the new geographies and uh, then we can take the advantage uh, in generating more accurate data, more accurate uh, national GHG inventory and also establishing more accurate baseline. And, and that's critical for everybody for uh, you know uh, reaching to the target of the NDC, as well as uh, to improve our carbon uh, projects, right? So, so I think this is very exciting and very interesting uh, webinar. And I'm sure everybody learned uh, a lot from this and the discussion you know, about uh, the remote sensing and this the difference between rice more and MRV was very exciting. And I think uh, we all uh, are maybe today on the same pace and um, can move towards more sustainable rice production system for uh, Asia and Africa moving forward.
So once again, thank you everyone and, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Verenda Kuma. And um, uh, I would like to also invite uh, the perspective of Dr. Yasuhito Shirato from the Global Research Alliance. If you could share um, your opinion about um, the relevance or the potential for collaboration in this area. Okay. Uh, thank you for thank you all uh, participants for today's seminar. I think uh, you all enjoy. Uh, the discussion and the presentation. And uh, this kind of information sharing and exchanging the experience is very important. And as uh, Dr. Kumar already mentioned, the baseline or the conventional practice of rice farming is different from country to country. So I'm in Japan and Japan is in Asia, but it's very dif different from Southeast Asia or South Asia and we are in East Asia. For example, the conventional uh, paddy water management in my country is single drainage of one week or 10 days during rice cropping period. We call it uh, mid-season drainage. So for example, the extend, extending the, the prolonging the period of this single drainage period, for example, from one week to two weeks. So one week more, one week longer, could be uh, one of the uh, promising uh, mitigation technique for reducing greenhouse gases in uh, from paddy rice field in my country. This, this is our uh, experience of our country, for example. And uh, as to the reporting, for example, on national scale, uh, uh, government uh, national greenhouse gas inventory, for example, we are using our DNDC rice model, so tier three method. Actually, we call it a tier, not tier three, tier 2.5. That's uh, we, in advance, we uh, run the model many times and uh, we derive the emission factor from the, the modeling result. That's kind of the uh, mixture of the country specific emission factor and the uh, TS3 modeling. This is uh, the experience of uh, my country, for example. So uh, many countries grow rice, not, not only uh, Asian country, but also Africa or America. So, I hope uh, this kind of uh, seminar like today for information sharing and exchanging experience is very uh, useful for all of us. So let's continue this kind of activity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yashi Dosirato. Um, we have had very many um, interesting questions and we've seen a very robust discussion on this topic. Um, we are coming close to the end of this webinar um, and our I've seen that the questions have been answered, but the speakers or uh, the specialists, the experts are still very much welcoming all of the um, interest or the questions um, that you can um then can raise after the event, please um, contact our speakers or our webinar organizers and we'll direct the questions to um, the experts. Are uh, and uh, we hope that this also sparks further discussion and research collaboration. Um, now to close the event, I would like to invite Dr. Virendra Kumar to give a closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Trang, again. So um, I think uh, I made the points. Uh, okay, just a second. Let me start my video. Is it working? No. Yes, the camera is on. Okay. Just give me a second. Something is wrong. Oh. 
Okay. Can I, can you hear me? Tran? Yes, yes. Yeah. So um, again, good morning, um, everyone. Uh, I made my technical points, but uh, um, on behalf of Iri and on behalf of uh, uh, this uh, Paddy Rice uh, uh, group, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to everyone for joining today's uh, webinar uh, in exploring this critical advancement uh, which has been made over the time in MRV system for rice sector. And today your active participation and valuable insight have enriched our discussion. And I'm sure uh, this discussion will further help us in building a sustainable future for rice production in Southeast Asia and beyond. Um, and, and we got two real good presentation, uh, first from Katie, which I think for me, it was a, a lot of learning. Even I was confused about different types of MRVs, national level, project level. Uh, uh, so these are very, very clear, uh, you know, uh, concepts. So we, we all are on the same page. Uh, and and also what are the pros and cons so that um, you know depending on your resources we can use what kind of system we want to use it but then uh, the next presentation which uh, uh, yen made it uh, also supporting the mrv system which uh, uh, katie talked about the key for any mrv system is data right so and, and this rice more is all about data collection uh, and uh, rice more is about data collection more efficiently. When we do manually, I think um, there could be uh, uh, chances of some error in writing or something. When we do digital data collection, I think we can minimize some of those uh, risk because we can uh, put filters, you know, it cannot be more than this value. And then it can be very, very fast. So I think, uh, the rice more um, very clearly showcased that uh, valid has been validated in Vietnam, and the results are really exciting, and uh, it looks like it is very easily transferable to other countries because the system, which different government use in in, in the region are similar. So, and as I said in my technical points, that uh, this data will help us in establish, establishing. The baseline, because baseline keep changing because of our continuous effort of promoting these mitigation options. So farmers not stay the same, you know, with, with over time, they keep changing their practices as we're advising, right? So this real time monitoring system through this uh, rice more will help us, okay, what is our current baseline? And, and if we have to target something, what we want to target uh, from, from the current baseline and how much we are uh, reducing emission. So uh, everything putting together will help us in more accurate uh, uh, national level inventory and ultimately global inventory. Uh, so I think this um, uh, for, for methane emission or for greenhouse gas emission from rice, I normally say that three master variables, right? If we can handle very well on water management, how farmers are managing water, if we have more accurate data, Collection on that. Second is straw management, how farmers are managing straw, uh, whether they're burning, incorporating, when they're incorporating, uh, how managing water and interaction of water and straw management is critical. And third is fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer for, from the perspective of nitrous oxide. I think these three variable are critical. And if we can more accurately uh, monitor these practices at farmers level, I think we can have a more accurate estimation of greenhouse gas emission. And with the more technologies uh, coming uh, up like remote sensing and then uh, modeling, Katie talked about DNDC, but it is also um, developing uh, ORISA for estimating greenhouse gas emission. And we are very quite advanced right now. I mean, uh, validation stays in Philippines. And this data, which we are collecting through Rice More, uh, I think can be very, very useful for further validating ORISA for estimating greenhouse gas emission using three uh, tier three approach. Currently, yes, we have intensive data uh, requirement for or, uh, for this modeling approaches, 
but I think Oriza is trying that once we validate, probably we won't require very intense data. With minimum data set, we can predict uh, more robust uh, you know, estimation of greenhouse gas emission using three, uh, tier three approach. As Katie said, uh, DNDC is copyrighted and very expensive. The licensing is very expensive. Hopefully with Oriza, uh, it will be much cheaper for, for everybody to use, uh, even in, in uh, carbon projects. So uh, I think that the, today the shared license and experience today um, have underlined an exciting opportunity to replicate the success across other Southeast Asian countries or going beyond. Um, I think uh, moving forward, I think it's important that we foster collaboration across countries, uh, invest more in research and innovation together and, and support the development of cost-effective adaptable MRV solutions. Uh, I think together we can uh, empower our uh, region or globally to take uh, meaningful strides towards low emission rice production system that align with our shared vision of green growth and resilience. So uh, at the end, on the behalf of ERI and our partners, once again, thank you uh, for your engagement, enthusiasm, and dedication to this cause. We look forward to working together to advance the adoption of MRV systems and to build a sustainable and climate smart future for rice production in Asia and beyond. So thank you once again for everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for the thank support. Thank you, Dr. Miranda Kuma. And thanks everyone for attending and contributing to this webinar. Special thanks to our speakers today. We hope this has been informative and helpful for your work and your research interests. And we really look forward to further discussion for research collaboration and technical assistance in this robustly developing area. We wish you a good day ahead. Goodbye. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Dr. Yashi Suhito. Very great collaboration. Uh, I hope that we can do uh, something similar in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.